Good morning, and welcome to the Sunday worship service of Friendship Presbyterian Church in Athens, Georgia. My name is Tom Buchanan, and I am the pastor of Friendship Church, and I'm glad to be joined today by my friend and Friendship Church member, Bev Davis, who will be serving as liturgist. We are both glad that you're with us today. It's good to be back leading worship and back here in this sanctuary. For all of you who worship with us regularly, you know that until last week I had been away to attend to my wife, Lisa, who was in the hospital for 25 days in January into early February. I'm glad to say that she has now been at home for the last three weeks and is well along the path to better days. Thanks to all of you who have expressed your love and concern and have lifted us up in prayer. To know that you are with us, supporting us, has been healing in itself. Lisa and I are both deeply grateful. Now today at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, in accordance with our congregational bylaws, we will hold our annual congregational meeting through the use of Zoom, the video conferencing software that will allow us to interact with one another. In that meeting, we will receive the annual report and receive the 2021 church budget, and we will approve, hopefully, my personal pastoral terms of call. All of you who are members of this congregation should have received by now a special email with the subject line, Annual Meeting of the Congregation. That email has within it a link to join the Zoom meeting at 11.30 a.m. sharp. Many of you have participated in Zoom meetings over the last year. Some of you have not. I know that it can be a little daunting if you've never done it. But believe me, you can do it. If you're hearing my words and there is still time, please know that I am here to help and to answer any questions that you may have. I know that this is a first for us, just as the congregational vote by email to elect new elders was a first. But we're up for it, and we will do what we need to do. Well, that's all I have to share now in the way of announcements. And so, as God's own people, let us now with gladness prepare our hearts for the worship of God. Join me now in the call to worship. We gather in the season of Lent, a time to examine our hearts and our lives and journey with Christ through the suffering of the world. Let us pick up our crosses and follow Christ towards our true home, along a path that is lined with God's love. God has marked us as beloved dust and called us together for praise. Let us worship God. 
Let us now sing together our opening hymn, Guide Me Now, O Thou Great Jehovah. Guide me, O Thou Great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fear subside. Death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. I will ever give to The scripture tells us that God is faithful and just, forgiving our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in the faithfulness, let us now confess that which would break our fellowship with God and one another through the use of the prayer of confession. Let us pray together saying, we are each on our own journeys toward our true home but we can't see the path ahead. We are on a journey together as a community of faith, and we venture forward not knowing what the future will hold. Sometimes our faith is shaken when the road looks dark or uncertain. Sometimes we feel terribly alone, losing the sense of being part of something much greater than ourselves. Have compassion on us and heal us, loving God. Replace our resignation with renewal and our fear with trust that we may be bold disciples and do the work to which we are called in our time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The one who calls us to this journey calls us to reconciliation through an amazing grace. God will not deny a, re a repentant heart or an open spirit. My friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes to us from the gospel of Mark, the eighth chapter, verses 31 to 38. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are settling your mind and not divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Cross of Jesus, cross of sorrow, where the blood of Christ was shed. Thank you. 
Our second scripture reading this morning comes to us from the 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, verses 1 through 3, and then 8 through 16, with a few comments on the verses that follow verse 16, and then ending with the first two verses of chapter 12. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered God faithful, who had promised. Therefore from one person, and this one as good as dead, Descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith, without having received the promises. But from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, God has prepared a city for them. And then the verses that follow through the rest of chapter 11 give more examples of saints who are called and engaged in the great journey. And then it concludes with the first two verses of chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, one of Lisa's cousins surprised and amazed us together with the rest of the extended family. He's only a little younger than we are, and at the time was in about as good a shape as I am right now, which is to say not very good shape. Now, I'm sure that there's a backstory that I don't know, but seemingly out of the blue, he announced that in a year and a half from that moment, when he made the announcement, that he would enter, run, and complete the Boston Marathon. He immediately changed his diet. He started exercising. And crucially, he started running. Jogging went from not being a part of his daily life at all to being a daily activity, filled with gradually more ambitious goals for distance and endurance. 
I have yet to hear from him a full explanation of what possessed him to make this commitment, but commit he did. And we enjoyed following his progress on a Facebook group page he set up, complete with regular updates and photos. And within months, he was running 5Ks. And months after that, half marathon. That's 13 miles at a time, folks. And then finally, the big day came, and he did it. He didn't win the race. He didn't get a feature story in the Boston Globe or get offered free tickets to Fenway Park, but he finished. He kept his word. When he started, no one, including him, knew just what it would take and what the journey would be like or what sacrifices would have to be made. And Lord knows it wasn't easy, but he set out in faith and saw the race to the end. He made it home. Now, last Sunday, we set out on our Lenten journey with a meditation on fasting and feasting. The idea that during Lent we do give up certain things, certain old patterns and practices, but not for the sake of self-denial itself, but so that we may feast on other things, better things, such as patience, compassion, and forgiveness, that we may more faithfully run the race that is set before us. But as sensible and even appealing as that may sound, anyone who has ever tried this knows that making this spiritual journey with intention and diligence, it's not easy. It involves sacrifice. It means unlearning some things. It even means, as Jesus puts it, losing our lives, denying ourselves and our own demands on life that we might find a home and a life beyond anything that we have yet been able to imagine. This truth is all over the pages of Scripture. This journey is a trek through what can feel like a wilderness. It's Moses and the Israelites leaving Egypt behind and wandering through a desert for 40 years. It's Jesus at the very dawn of his public ministry being tempted by Satan for 40 days and nights in the middle of nowhere. It's Abraham hearing God's call in his old age and setting out towards a home that he had never seen. All these scripture lifts up as examples of what faith looks like. As we are told in that wonderful 11th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of, of things not seen. It is trust in the face of uncertainty. The scripture tells us that when Abraham stepped out the door, he didn't know where he was going or how his story was going to play out. He could not have imagined what awaited him on the other side of that obedience, what adventures would be had. What a destiny into which he would live. But his faith impelled him to trust God with that destiny. And he never looked back. And as it was with Abraham, so it is with all those who are then named in that part of the scripture text I passed over. Isaac, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, King David, 
prophet Samuel, and all the other prophets, each in their own time stepped out in trust into the unknown. None knew where they were going or what there would look like. None knew how their own personal story would play out. Now, some would go by ordinary standards very, very well, conquering kingdoms, administering justice, knowing victory and success. But others, others would be tortured, suffer mocking and flogging, chains and imprisonment, even death. Still others would go about persecuted, destitute, wandering the face of the earth. And as it was for all of these, so it would be later for a band of fishermen on the shore of the Sea of Galilee who would be called to take up their own crosses and follow. And as it was for them, so it is with us. We are gathered here today because each of us is on a journey, a journey of a life lived in the light of faith, a faith that has claimed us, and yet we can't see where our roads will lead us. We are here today because we are on a journey together as a community of faith, having covenanted to stand with and for one another. But we together venture forward not knowing what the future will hold. We can't know that we will succeed and not fail. Often we don't see how our part matters or what difference any of our efforts and struggles will make. And we don't grasp our place in the big picture, if there is one. That's really the scary part, isn't it? It's not knowing. It's not being in charge. It's not being in control of your own life's story. We would always love to know where we are and what things truly mean, and where we're headed, and how best to proceed forward. But such clarity is neither the promise nor the hope of the gospel. In one of my favorite scenes in the movie adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, you knew that would come up somehow, The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, the hobbit Frodo is more or less carrying the weight of the world around his neck. And even with the support of his faithful companion, Sam, he struggles with the temptation to just give up. He says, I can't do this, Sam. Sam looks at him and responds, I know. It's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. But we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. Frodo says, 
What are we holding on to, Sam? And Sam responded, that there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Perhaps you have never borne a ring of power to the fires of Mount Doom, but I suspect that you do know something of the crushing weight of the world, the pain of uncertainty and waiting, the pain of loneliness, not knowing how your story could ever have a good ending. In all these things, what can sustain us? What is it that we can hold on to? One of the first things that Frodo learns on the journey is that while he alone would have to bear the burden of the ring and its peculiar darkness, his own baggage, if you will, he would not have to make the journey alone. Sam nearly drowns himself trying to catch up with an escaping Frodo who had determined that the task was too dangerous to risk anyone's life other than his own. Frodo, trying to get away, has to stop and save his friend, and he pulls him into his boat. It's no good trying to escape you, Frodo is finally forced to concede. But I'm glad, Sam. I cannot tell you how glad. Come along. It is plain that we were meant to go together. We are meant to go together. We do not have to make this journey alone. We share our lives and our burdens with one another. We would learn to trust. And nobody pretends that this is easy. But as we go on together, as we serve together, as we break bread together, as we learn and grow together, we find that we are slowly moving beyond the narrow confines of our own self-concern and find that we are being rooted in a story and a promise that is so much bigger than ourselves. Taking these steps into the unknown is hard, I know. And there are many times along the journey when we meet with disappointments, learn hard lessons, endure pain, and even tragedy. And like Frodo, we may wonder if we have the strength to go on. But even in these times, there is so much more than we can now see. As the Cherokee elder said to his discouraged son, Why do you sit brooding, my boy? Do you not know that you are being driven by great winds across the sky? Abraham and Sarah, Moses, Rahab, David, those fishermen by the sea, all were human and struggled and doubted. But in the end, all of them trusted that they were part of something more. And so they lived with hope, even if sometimes it felt like a fool's hope. This is what their stories would finally teach us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us to the glory of God. Amen. Thank you.
Having now heard the word of God and being uplifted by beautiful music, let us now affirm our faith together as God's own people. Let us affirm together, saying, We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let us bring the needs of our own hearts, the needs of our communities, indeed the needs of the whole world before the throne of grace, that we might, might find help in our time of need. Let us Pray together. O Holy One, we thank you that we stand in a long line of believers who have been faithful through the ages. You have been leading your people through trial and difficulty and have always set before them hope for today and hope for a better tomorrow. We pray that you would bless us in our time as we seek to be faithful, just as Abraham and Moses, Jesus himself were faithful in the face of the wilderness and the unknown. May we too know the faith which is filled with hope in things not seen. Give to us, O God, a faith like the grain of a mustard seed, which has small beginnings, but which yields large results. Give to us, O God, the faith to move the mountains of difficulty which come to each of us. Give to us the faith that sees a distant goal and is willing to work to achieve it. Give to us a faith which has a vision of a new world where peace and love characterize the transactions of people and of nations and where war is no more. Give to us, O God, a faith such as Abraham's and Sarah's to move forward not knowing our destination, but trusting in your loving hand. Give to us a faith which is able to endure those moments of personal disquiet and to trust that you are with us. Give to us a faith which sees the welfare of all humankind as our business because it is the focus of your enduring love. We lift up to you the needs of all humankind, near and far. O oh God, give to us a faith which sees beyond the years to your eternal city. O oh God, give us faith to walk with you through the ebb and the flow and the victories and the defeats of life and to achieve the victory which alone is in Christ Jesus. We offer this prayer in his name, in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now honor our most gracious and generous God through the sharing of our own gifts, gifts from the resources with which God has richly blessed us, indeed the gifts of our very lives. God of the sparrow, God of the whale, God of the swirling stars, how does the creature say all? How does the creature say praise? God of the earthquake, God of the storm, God of the trumpet blast, how does the creature cry woe? How does the creature cry save? God of the rainbow, God of the cross, God of the empty grave, how does the creature say grace? How does the creature say thanks? God of the hungry, God of the sick, God of the prodigal, how does the creature say care? How does the creature say life? God of the neighbor, God of the foe, God of the pruning hook, how does the creature say love? How does the creature say peace? God of the ages, God near at hand, God of the loving heart, how do your children say joy? How do your children say hope? Well, we are now at the end of our time together this morning. Thank you so very much for joining us, and we hope that you'll be back with us again next Sunday. If you have any comments or questions or would like to make a prayer request, please reach out to me at pastortom at gotofriendship.org. And so let us now go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen.